Thank you for the uh, kind invitation to uh, come to the university here. I'm, I'm very honored by this opportunity and that truthfully it gave me an opportunity to spend some time thinking about the future of public markets. Uh, and I hope, you know, this presentation to, you know, cover three areas like why markets matter, but how they are endangered as well at the same time by many forces and what we can do about it. So um, PPS was this uh, organization that I helped found. Uh, I was not there at the, at the, from the very beginning, but almost from the very beginning. Um, it was a very small organization with a, a kind of a crazy idea that you could understand how people use public spaces and that it, that would indeed matter to cities. Um, and this is an idea that has grown and grown and grown and then public space has become a field of inquiry. Uh, people are now realizing that quality public spaces are so important to communities of all sizes. Um, over my long career at PPS, I'd had the opportunity to work in all kinds of public spaces from squares and parks and public buildings and, you know, downtowns. Um, and uh, through sort of a community process to re-envision these spaces and to make them more active and viable places for people. But my heart has always been in markets. And um, I loved markets from the very beginning, but I had a very, in, in retrospect, a very simplistic attitude towards them because it just were, they were ways to sort of activate a public space and, you know, people seemed to enjoy them so much and they brought such life. But now I understand that they are far deeper, far more complicated. Um, and as we've begun to explore this issue globally, globally most recently in an international conference in London in June, um, we have developed this idea of market cities, which is a way of viewing the future of markets uh, and um, making them more integral to city life and city policy. So our website is full of information about public spaces. I uh, am not gonna talk much about our other public spaces work. I'm gonna focus really on the public markets side. But I think the uh, principles and the way we work, you know, across us over um, these different types of public spaces. So um, we do do uh, a range of things with our public markets program. We actually provide technical assistance to cities or, or people that want to start a new market or fix up an old market, revitalize an existing market, and do, you know, a community process and feasibility studies. We do quite a lot of training programs. We have a biannual training program in New York. We host this uh, international conference roughly every three years. Um, and we're expanding, right now, we're expanding our research. We have done a considerable amount of research on how uh, markets can serve low income uh, and communities. I'm gonna share some of the results of that with you today. Uh, periodically, we get money to uh, re-grant to communities to um, undertake market programs that utilize the markets to achieve a broader uh, community impact. So, uh, just so we're on the same definitional page, um, we have a very broad definition of public markets. Public, and it encompasses a lot of different kinds of markets. But the, the public markets uh, have three sort of core attributes. They operate in public spaces. They, in fact, are public spaces. Uh, they have public goals and public mission that's broader than just the transaction itself. And they serve exclusively lo lo uh, locally owned and operated businesses. So, but, but within that def definition, there are, you know, quite a variety of, of kinds of markets that you can have. And um, we have, we've just sort of in our conversations about the research, so we have different names for these different markets, but I'm gonna use my names for this. This is the open air markets. These are, these are temporary markets. They move around, uh, they're don't, they have no, a specific facility. Um, this is the Union Square Green Market in New York City, which is the largest open air market. Um, the city operates four days a week. It was a, it was a driving uh, force behind the revitalization of Union Square, which when the market opened in 1975 was quite dangerous and had quite a lot of drug dealing and a lot of the buildings were abandoned around the square. And um, the uh, 
market was the first positive element to go into the into the into the space and has eventually expanded to over 50 markets uh, around the city. This is another uh, space in New York that was uh, pretty down on its heels. It had a lot of drug dealing in it as well. It was very much abandoned right on 42nd Street. Um, the Bryant Park to, of today is completely extraordinary. All the buildings here you see here in the winter are temporary buildings. The um, uh, but you can see the holiday market and these wonderful glass uh, 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 structures. Smorgasburg is a is a it's a it's a market that actually operates in primarily and temporarily in either temporary public spaces like a building site that hasn't been built on, or, or they now have a location in a major park. Uh, but they they uh, come in they are, they're there for one day. Uh, they have about 100 all prepared food vendors, a very unusual mix of people. Um, you know, you, there are a lot of people eating in, in this market. So the next step up is covered markets. So these have a little bit of infrastructure that enable the market to operate uh, less seasonally than you can outside. And the simple ones are just like covered sheds. Uh, very often, multi purpose, this one actually is used as a parking lot when it's not being used as a market. Um, the, um, this is one, this is a, a neighborhood food market in Amsterdam. It's maybe once a month in the Wester Gas Fabric. Um, it's basically an open air market that's inside. Um, and so there's a lot of advantages to these kind of uh, facilities, but the, the most permanent kind of markets are market halls. And this is uh, like the Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia was built in the late 19th century, we had a train station on the second floor. The market was on the first floor. Much of the product would come in from the neighboring countryside by train and then just be transported downstairs. Uh, uh, the, the market has evolved, of course, over the year. The train shed is now a uh, convention center, which brings a lot of visitors and tourists into the market. Um, but it's about 80,000 square feet of year-round business open uh, seven days a week. Um, the Boston Public Market is a new market that we helped get started. It was built in a building um, that was built for um, the Central Artery Project, which was the large tunnel project that they built uh, to uh, get rid of a, a highway in, in uh, Boston. And the, the building was built to disguise the ventilation shafts for the tunnel. But this space was owned by the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and so this market is a year-round market, but in order to sell in this market, you have to grow or make your product um, in the New England area, which is you know, within a, roughly a 200-mile uh, radius of, of Boston. Probably the most advanced kind of, of markets are these market districts. Uh, the one in this picture is in Santa Fe. These are uh, markets that have multiple facilities. They might have a farmer's market, they may have an arts market, they may have a brewery, they may have food shops. Um, it's not just a standalone market, it's really part of a, a broader district. This one is uh, the Pike Place Market in Seattle. It's the probably largest public market in the country uh, and it's nine acres in size. The, um, the uh, Market has both like these produce sheds and they have farmers. This is an organic farmers market it's in the street. They have about 400 businesses uh, located throughout the district. Um, this has um, become challenged because of tourism. Um, it's become you know, internationally known. And so in the summer months, particularly with the new, new cruise ships that are gi gigantic, you know, there are uh, thousands of more people are, are visiting this market, but that tends to um, uh, make locals less likely to shop there during the summer tourist season. So uh, markets have many public benefits. They, um, and I've alluded to some of these in the slides that I just showed, but uh, they, you know, renew uh, downtowns and neighborhoods. They can, they can be the catalyst that can be used to um, uh, spur development. Um, they uh, are more and more used for public health purposes for the markets that we've been working in low income neighborhoods, you know, rely on, on um, programs that enable people to buy fresh 
fruits and vegetables at a discounted price. Um, they link urban and rural economies if they are involve farmers and local producers. Um, of course, my, you know, they, how I got started with it, they create these active public spaces. But I wanted to focus um, today on like two of the two of the um, benefits that may be you know more relevant to the series of talks you're having today. The ones, the first one is um, how markets bring diverse people together. Um, in 2004, we did a, a, a research for the Ford Foundation, um, and they wanted to understand how markets. Uh, we're serving what they call shifting sands communities. And that, you know, it's really a thought, an idea that's really was ahead of its time. And now we see the, you know, the results of, you know, new immigrants coming in the U.S. and, you know, all the backlash that we've had uh, in our country. Um, we see some of that in Europe as well. Um, but the... Uh, we wanted to understand really the, the, the dynamics of, you know, how you might break that down. And so we looked at markets that were serving um, low-income neighborhoods. These were intentionally selected markets. They weren't like a randomly selected. We, and as a result, um, they have a very specific kind of point of view, I guess you would say. But we had an open-ended question. As you know, you know, when you have open-ended questions, you don't know really what you're going to get. And we asked one question, what is the benefit of the market to the community? And while people mentioned like the, uh, you know, freshness, convenience, price, you know, the, the um, uh, economic aspects, the number one answer was bring people together. So this raise, raised other questions that, um, you know, we, and we would try to get a little bit more deeper. This was some research that was done in 2012 by one of our partners in, in uh, New Orleans, and they created a, a, a tool called NEED, a Neighborhood Exchange Evaluation Device, but basically is trying to assess the, what, what it call social capital, what, what is actually going on in a market other than the sort of, you know, economic transactions, and what's the result of it? And um, shopping, and people said, 48, 58% said supporting locals, and 14% said answer atmosphere, which I guess is, you know, the theme of one of your previous speakers. Um, this was an interesting question. Several vendors at the market are selling the same quality of tomatoes. Where are you most likely to purchase yours? And 43% answered the, the favorite vendor. So this suggests that, you know, there's this beyond the price of something, there's a, some, some dynamic that is going on between the customer and the vendor that uh, is important to the customer and, and, you know, economically important to the vendor. And they also ask the vendor, do you let any customers purchase on credit? <coughs> So that, that's an indication of, you know, trust, really. You know, you, you build up a relationship, you trust someone to come back, you know, the next week with their $10 or whatever to give you, and 56% and said yes. So um, more recently, um, my colleague William Fulford in London um, did his PhD dissertation. He comes from a, a kind of market family. They were very involved with starting markets in the 1970s in London. Um, and he raised the question, do markets connect people? If so, how? Well, we, we understood that the, the markets do connect people. It was the how that we wanted to. And so he developed a, a kind of interesting uh, methodology of different research and created this conceptual framework, which I'll show in a second. Um, did a lot of intercept surveys of vendors and, and did uh, inter, uh, uh, audio tape interviews, including audio taping some interactions between the customers and the vendors. And what he, what he found is what he called functional encounters. And he, that is what he feels is like key to a market. A functional encounter really is, is the, the actual transaction. Here, I'm buying this from you. And you know that apparent, that opens what he discovered in his research. That opens a lot of other um, you know uh, dynamics that are really cr critical to understanding why markets matter to bridging differences. 
Um, this one trader said, trade is a thing that forces you to know your fellow people, and that's why it's sometimes beautiful, as otherwise people wouldn't interact with me, would, would, wouldn't interact with me in another way. So these functional accounters, they help when you're having a transaction or a conversation with someone not like yourself, you reduces the fear of strangers, it helps build trust. Um, it's good practice to do this. Um, you get interested in what the other person's life is like and what foods they're eating and you know, how, does, how, does, uh, uh, how does the market relate to their personal situation. Um, he feels like they got a sense that, that they're, a collective sense that we're stronger together as opposed to isolated group. And of course, there's economic opportunity for that as well. One of the questions he asks is, is the market a place where you mix <clears throat> positively with people from different backgrounds? Um, and what's interesting is there, there's a small pie on the chart there, the top little quadrant of that are people that disagreed at one level or the other. Red is neutral, and the other people are agreeing on some level. So, you know, well over, you know, 90% are neutral or agree that the marketplace with, was uh, a place where people mixed. And this is a, a neighborhood that with, which is increasingly diverse neighborhood in London. And as one trader said, I've learned such a lot from mar this market. I truly mean it. I've learned not to be prejudiced, which is the greatest thing I've learned. So the, the, so the, social, the social reasons for being in a market are really as important as the economic transactions. And the economic transactions also provide you know, economic opportunity. And that was really the second focus of our forward research in 2004, is, is how do public markets create a vehicle for upper mobility for low-income people? And so in these specifically selected markets, uh, we of course had a very uh, broad mix of, of uh, ethnic ethnicity of, of uh, vendors. You can see that here. Um, Asian was the largest population, but it, it was, there was, a, there was sort of a broad mix. And we asked the, the vendors what they liked about the markets as well. And you know, the number one answer there is again, kind of the, the people, the meeting the people, the sense of diversity, the sense of community. You know, atmosphere was the second one. Third is the sort of economics about making money and Products and tradition were sort of the last on the list. So um, again, we're, you were kind of seeing the similar trends. Um, and we asked the vendors how much uh, it costs for them to start their business in the market. And you, if you look, these numbers are a little old, but you can see that like, you know, around half the people said it was less than $1,000, which is not much. So it's a, it's a very low barrier to entry to, to starting a business. And the, um, uh, in the people that are, you know, investing like more than 10,000, those are, those are, those are serious investors. Those would be some of the indoor markets that require a lot of, uh, equipment and refrigeration and that kind of thing. The open air markets, you know, you could 10% spend less than hundred dollars, bought a table and, you know, started their business. Um, what was interesting is how market vendors funded these, and 83% said personal savings. So this is, again, like an indicator of how, what a low entry is. They, uh, you know, they, they cobbled together some money, they started the business, um, they uh, then were able to grow it from there. Um, this is something we were talking about this morning as well. The, <clears throat> The percentage of vendors' income from selling at markets. There's a lot of people. <coughs> excuse me. There are a lot of <coughs> there are a lot <coughs> there are a lot of people selling at markets that uh, are making less than 10% of their income on 
being a vendor. And you know, I remember talking to this one vendor in a market in California, and I said, well, like, why do you bother? You know, like, why do you come here? And she said, well, my husband watches foot, it's a Sunday market, my husband watches football every Sunday, and, you know, I'm, you know, rather than sit around home, I thought I'd, I'd rather be a market vendor. I don't really make very much money, but, you know, I love the people, and I pay, you know, I make a little bit. Um, so there's like something, a term called income patching. You're like you're just, you have a little bit of money, you're patching a little bit more money on it. And, you know, the people that are making, you know, 100% of their income from being a mark vendor um, are what we call serious, the, the lower level casual. It's a sort of, it's not a, it's a continuum. It's not a hard, fast uh, differentiation. So we also asked them a whole bunch of, of uh, questions about uh, upper mobility indicators. Uh, you know, everything from, you know, does it, sending your kids to college, going on vacation, um, moving to a bigger apartment. Uh, you can sort of see the different um, things we talked about. But, but when we like cross tabulated the casual vendors from the serious vendors, what we discovered that all the vendors were, they were paying bills, they were taking money, taking vacation, which really kind of blew our mind away that that's, that's where they got their vacation money. It's actually, and sending money to family, especially if they were immigrants, and sending it back to their home country. Um, whereas the, you know, the, the, the vendors with other retail locations, the serious vendors were they were moving to bigger apartments, they were buying houses, they were sending their kids to college, they were opening their businesses. But you know, the point is that the market enables uh, people to uh, begin this path of economic mobility, upward mobility, um, and gradually expand um, their businesses, test their businesses, grow their businesses. Um, and this is a very powerful thing that we, in, the, in today's society where you know, we're overburdened with chain stores and you know, grocery stores are really changing. This get, really provides the opportunity for the, the small business person. So I wanted to talk about one case study in uh, Flint, Michigan, that uh, um, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a kind of a case study of, uh, I've just been recently looking at the benefits. There's been a lot of studies recently about this market that uh, opened in a new location. This is a picture taken in 2014 at its grand opening. Um, and it's one of the, my pro the projects I'm probably most proud of, just not because it's a great market, which it always was and just has a new location, but because of all the positive um, impacts. And if you've heard about Flint, it, it, this is probably what you've heard about Flint. Flint had the most serious lead water crisis, the, the worst public um, health crisis in the United States in recent memory. Um, the uh, cause of this was a shifting of the um, water supply from the city of Detroit to the Flint River, because this was going to save money. The city was very in bad straits. It was in bankruptcy, it was being administrated, administrated by the state. Um, and this cost-saving measure was enacted. This is a map showing, if, you, if you've, Michigan geography is a little off, this is, you know, Flint is in right at the heart of the Rust Belt, used to be a major auto center. Um, the, the city has, you know, dropped in size significantly since in the last 20 or 30 years. So today, over 40% of the population of Flint live in poverty. This is just a map showing the uh, concentration, the depth of poverty, a lot of vacancy of land, uh, you know, kind of classic decay of the American city. But, you know, the, the bright spot in, in the market um, was always, uh, oh, and Flint was always the Flint farmer's market. And they, uh, but there was such a public uproar that a nonprofit organization that was um, um, involved with revitalization of the downtown took over the operations of the market. And they hired a, a manager. He's a, a guy that was a social, retired social studies teacher in Flint. And he knew everybody in Flint because everybody had had his social studies class. Um, and he turned out to be like a natural. He brought this market back to life. And it was a very exciting thing to see. It was a very simple market. There was an indoor part that was um, 
uh, open year round, three days a week, and then a seasonal shed that was open in the summer with farmers. Um, but it needed a lot of work. And you know, we had done a study to see what it would take to like fix up this building. And they were having a hard time convincing anybody to invest in this market because it was sort of on the periphery of downtown, whereas uh, all the revitalization monies, all the revitalization's interest was right in the center of downtown. And so this building became available. Um, the, in, a, in a declining city like Flint, one of the first casualties is often the newspaper. And the newspaper became an online edition. They had just built a printing factory for their newspaper 10 years before this. Um, and they abandoned their office building and the printing factory right in the center of downtown. It was, became this visible symbol, yet another one, of Flint's decline. And you know the printing factory was in like remarkably great condition. It was a new building, had you know all the plumbing, all it needed to be you know a significant investment is involved with you know putting a market into a market in a space like this. But the bones were very good, the location was very good, and so we proceeded with that. And so we you know took an old market which you know had very little room for growth and. Um, the la lack of utility upgrades. The utility upgrade turned out to be critical because two months before the new market opened, the city switched the water supply location. And it wasn't known, the impact didn't happen immediately. So by the time the water crisis really hit, the new market was open. Also, how yeah, that was important. So, you know, the new market has, you know, new infrastructure, it was bigger. All of these were risks too, by the way. It was no, there was no like guarantee that this new market was going to uh, work. And we had uh, you know, some uh, rather um, tense community meetings because people loved, loved the old market. They loved the little market by the river. And they, they were afraid to go downtown, even though it was only half a mile away. But uh, as soon as the doors opened in June of 2014, all those fears went away. And one of, the, one of the design principles that we used in, the, in this market was to design it around the public spaces. You think you would start the building design with the vendors. No, you start with where the public social activities are going to take place and then how the, how the economic activities relate to that. So right at the front of the main door of the market is this plaza. And you know, there's, there's, it doesn't connect directly to the seasonal shed. It's the new one that was built. Uh, intended the, potentially to create this space in front of the market. Uh, a, a log plaza was uh, left in front of the market to create places for people to sit and have lunch. And because the old market had, you know, really lacked social space, and the street is closed on Saturdays for um, art marks, arts and crafts markets. So it's become a, like a mini, like. Um, Arts, uh, market district, and in the middle of the market is this atrium, which is where the printing uh, presses used to stand. Was they were three stories tall, so you know when we were standing at the space, it's like you know double the size of the space, and we're used to being in this little market, this low ceiling, and and um, we thought, oh, you know, it's, what are people going to think of this <laughs> gigantic space? And it turned out that like, people loved it. And you know, people are getting married in this space now. There's, it's used for vending and seating, and they have a whole range of events. And next to the, here's some, next to it is a, is a, is a, what, a demonstration kitchen. So this is where people learn how to you know, cook you know, more healthy foods. It also doubles as a catering kitchen. So when you have the event in the market, it can service uh, the, the atrium. And also behind there is a very large community room set up for an exhibition now, but this is like wedding receptions and fundraisers and, you know, all different. And meanwhile, the, the businesses had more space to um, uh, open. They had better infrastructure for their stalls, you know, the whole design and feel. We actually um, lowered the ceiling and to create a second floor on the market because we, we felt like the uh, the feeling of the market would be better. It would be more similar to the old market if, if the ceiling wasn't too tall. Um, the shed is almost exactly the same size as the old shed. 
Um, this is one of the new vendors that moved into the market because there was space. He, was, he had won the best barbecue in Flint contest five years in a row and um, is now a very popular uh, vendor in the market. Um, the, the market has you know, opened the doors to a lot more um, uh, immigrants, had space to sort of diversify its mix. Um, and upstairs, that because the ceiling was low, the uh, pediatric a children's clinic located. And um, this turned out to be the most fortuitous of all, of all the, you know, the good fortunes that, because in this doctor, in, in this clinic is where the doctor practiced that first noticed the increase in lead in her ch children's, pay, in her children's, and, um, not, and, w and when people, um, were not reacting to her reporting this. She blew the whistle on the whole crisis and went public with it. You know, it was very controversial. Uh, everyone looked bad in the state and the city. Um, and here she's back on time, you know, most influential people probably of 2015. Um, and so the, the market then very quickly had, um, adapted to this health crisis by kind of serving as the sort of center for healthy food in the neighborhood. And because uh, the market was immediately adjacent to the bus terminal in Flint, the transportation center where every bus line comes, it was very convenient for people from disadvantaged neighborhoods to get to. And the neighborhoods themselves were losing uh, grocery stores and, and not um, having local access, but having it uh, with one bus ride away. away. So uh, there's some in, in, innovative programs. One's the prescription for health program. So when you go to see the doctor uh, at the clinic, you're g given a $10 coupon um, to spend on fresh produce. And so you come downstairs and you, and you buy produce that counteracts the effects of lead. So you take your $10 to the, the produce vendor. The produce vendor is very happy. The people are very happy. They, um, and double food bucks enables uh, shoppers using um, their um, uh, SNAP. It's at a, we used to call them food stamps, but there's a, it's a subsidized food program. You get, when you buy fresh Michigan grown products, you get basically half off the price. Um, but the market was also great for health fairs and because of its convenient access and the, it, it became kind of a center for public health. So in the end, the relocation had a, a pretty major impact with, in terms of the number of businesses that were added. The, there, were, there are 275 jobs in the market now versus 85 in 2014 before it moved. Foot traffic has doubled. Um, studies done by two universities have shown that that the um, the people shopping at the market are equitably distributed. It's a regional market, so it uh, serves both inner city Flint and the wealthier suburbs. But it's it's a it's a the demographic mix of the shoppers actually reflects the demographic mix of the region, um, and sales have gone up. The number of people at events and. It was actually named one of the great places in America 2015. So um, it's, a, it, it's sort of the shining bright light in the whole Flint water crisis. And it, it illustrates the, the, the potential that markets could have to address uh, not just shopping needs, but a whole variety of, of other public needs. So at our, our 2019 conference, uh, two, sorry, sorry, 2015 conference in, in Barcelona, we did a sort of national, inter global solicitation process for people to nominate endangered markets. Um, and, you know, markets are endangered by many forces. They're endangered, you know, you know by neglect. They're endangered by supermarkets. They're endangered by um, changing food buying habits. Uh, they're endangered by war. Um, you know, just simple, you know, not n lack of investment or not understanding the need for lack of investment. And this is not a, an issue. The issues are different between the global north and the global south, but um, uh, the lack of awareness um, about the, uh, the power of these markets um, is, un is kind of a universal phenomenon. And so one of the, one of the uh, most endangered markets in the world 
in, the, in Barcelona, at our Barcelona Cup was the Chao Long Market in Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, this is the market. And this is what happened to one of its predecessor markets, which became a shopping center, a really bad shopping center at that. Uh, the market was located in a very prime real estate and you know, it, the uh, city decided it was a better use of land to do this. Now, as a result of partly as of the designation, but also again, a public outrage in even in a communist country, uh, the city has stop, stopped this sort of policy and process. But this sort of opened the door to kind of a different way of thinking about the markets in Hanoi um, and in other cities. And so th this, this is a term we call market cities, which is a new vision for public markets, thinking about them at the citywide and regional scale. Um, our goal is to recognize the, the value of markets uh, uh, the unique magnetism of markets at public space and develop supportive policies to address myriad, myriad of civic, critical civic and societal issues. So I had the opportunity to uh, spend a month in Hanoi last fall um, working with Healthbridge Canada, which is a Canadian um, NGO foundation that uh, works on livable communities, and they have they have picked up the idea of market cities in a very big way, and they're they're going to be our partner going forward. We work with the Hanoi Architects Association and AgoHub, which was a local design center. Um, so this is Hanoi. Uh, if you've not been there, it's quite a remarkable city. Um, it you know it, it lacks like consistency in planning, probably. You know, all those tall buildings were once a wet market. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it's, you know, nine million people and seven million motorbikes. But it, remarkably, um, it's, a, it's a, um, quite a dynamic city. It was, you know, built, you know, as many cities grew up around their markets. And uh, there were many forms of these markets. And um, they were, you know, very much a part of the day-to-day -day routine. It's still, and still, are very much part of the day-to-day -day routine. They're, they're just not getting the investment they need. Uh, <clears throat> Healthbridge pre prepared this map which shows uh, the um, existing markets in uh, Hanoi and the, the circles are the, you know, the walkable distance around it. So you can see these markets really cover most everyone in the city. There are a few gaps. Um, they continue to build some new ones on the outskirts of Hanoi. Um, but the main challenges were, you know, sort of lack of understanding for like the value, uh, the lack of maintenance, the, uh, uh, the rampant development, the, you know, the development could go anywhere, so if you're going to build a big building, you might as well put it on a market, um, and increasing amount of supermarkets and other options for customers. So we wanted to, you know, now we had stopped the policy to, to, to demolish the markets, and replace them with shopping centers, it begged the question like, what do you do with these markets? And how do you uh, upgrade them and maintain their authenticity, um, expand the opportunities for vendors? And you know, Healthbridge is interested is really maintaining the uh, healthy food source for um, the people in the city that you know, rely on these markets. And, but it turned out what was most compelling to you know, a lot of city officials uh, was this vision, which is this, the market was not just a place to buy and sell, but that it was a public space too. And in, and in fact, you could, you, you could use the markets, you could develop public spaces around the markets, on the markets, and these would add to the attraction. So we, had, we picked three pilot markets that uh, had um, uh, some constituencies and some money behind their, them to, you know, do some basic renovation. And you know, when I started this project, I thought that you know the most optimistic outcome would be that they would go in and fix the roofs, because really, I mean, you, the, when you see some of the pictures of them, you can understand. But it turned out to be you know a much bigger outcome than I had originally imagined. These are the these are the architectural teams we had five or six teams each working on uh, markets. And the idea wasn't to come up with a perfect scheme. But the idea was come up with as many ideas as possible because I didn't want to have people 
say that the um, uh, um, market, uh, they like this design for the market, or they didn't like this design for the market, so we shouldn't do anything. So lots of different ideas. And we spent a lot of time talking about what, what were the elements of the markets we wanted to preserve in terms of local traditions. And, you know, these are, you know, uh, students in their early 20s that have, you know, grown up around the markets, they understand the family dynamics and, you know, how, how families shop at the markets and, you know, the trust that, they, and that was their word, trust between the vendors and the customer where, especially for food safety is issue, is not always the greatest. When you, you're going to the vendor, you trust that, that that product is a good product. But also recognizing, as you can see from the picture, there's a little bit of a need for some upgrading. Um, the, and so the, you know, how do you, how do you actually do this and, and what's, what's the process of what, what is the broader policy implication? So I'll just show you, this is the market that was um, on the, is no longer on the endangered list because it has been saved. Um, nothing has been done to it yet, but it has been saved. And some of its positive qualities, it was on the, uh, location on the Truckbuck Lake, which is one of the amenities of, of the city, its last major market in central Hanoi, and um, really some unbelievable product in that market, all coming in fresh daily from the countryside, um, amazing fruits and vegetables, and um, the market was unusually designed. There was a market hall on the inside, but little businesses that circled the entire outside of the market, and that created this really vibrant neighborhood hub. Uh, but inside, it's like the drainage was really bad. The, the, the one of the curious things is you can, one of the, if you have a, one of your motorbikes, you can drive it into the market and down the aisle and go right to the vendor. So you're in the market shopping and then all of a sudden you like, someone is like <laughs> driving behind you. Um, we didn't tackle that issue. That's going to be a longer term issue to get people off their motorbikes. But, um, and with the roof leaks, what they do is you, hold, you, you hang these tarps, and then the tarps are up for years. And you can see that um, you know, the um, water system is a garden hose. And you know, it's just really um, kind of a, a fire waiting to happen. The food safety is a um, big issue, but you know, there are ways within the culture to enhance it without totally changing it. Um, so anyway, this was, our, this was our workshop, and these were some of the ideas that came out of it. The, one, of the, one, of the, one of the goals was to uh, uh, create some modular stalls, so, you know, the vendors were just putting together almost anything they had, um, or even if it was a decrepit stall that was 30 years old, they would keep using it. And so the architects thought that, you know, the stalls that you might add a hand washing sink to, a small refrigerator, um, something you could stack and adapt in different circumstances that were low cost would be useful. The, rethinking the, the markets themselves in terms of their identity, um, and they, a lot of these markets don't have much visibility. Um, fixing the roofs so they don't leak, and without rebuilding the whole structure. And, and rearranging market sheds so that you create, you know, public spaces, these social spaces within the market. Uh, on the, the Chao Long market, the one proposal was to put a park on top of the market with um, maybe prepared food vendors and a restaurant on the second floor with the market vendors on the first floor. This, this particular picture made a lot of newspapers in Hanoi. Uh, people, and you know, the, the mayor of Hanoi was recently an event. This was nominated as one of three best ideas of 2019 in Hanoi. Unfortunately, we didn't win, but we got the mayor to, to inspect the board. So I think um, we began to see that the, the des design and infrastructure needs of the, of the, of the markets was bigger than uh, uh, just design, that really there needed to be a whole you know, investment and, and, and policy and partnership component to this program as well as uh, market management operations needed to be upgraded. And 
it, it's uh, uh, Health Bridge is now working with the Ministry of Trade and Industry, which is uh, revising all of the re regulations for wet markets in Vietnam by 2020. So this is probably like the best possible outcome if you were to have other than actually beginning to fix the market, but this is the first step to actually creating some capital monies to invest in the markets. So some of the principles of market cities this illustrates, and there's some others as well. We, market cities make holistic assessments of their market systems and recognize their value. And um, HealthBridge has taken this to other cities they work with. In Kampala, Uganda, they just completed the uh, basic assessment, and the health bridge is trying to get ahead of the curve in Africa, where the markets are not yet endangered, but you know are likely to be endangered. Um, and so it's you know quantifying and mapping the types of markets, and you know looking at you know how they're functioning, and collecting some basic information about the whole system of market, which is surprisingly limited. Um, market cities nurture inclusive public spaces and place making. One example of this is the Singapore Hawker Centers. These are a whole series of uh, prepared food markets that are also really public squares and uh, throughout the city. Um, and you know, they came to the London conference. They're trying to figure out what more, how, how they could utilize this asset even more effectively than they are now. Uh, market cities plan distribution network that prioritizes healthy, locally, and regionally produced food in other goods. One example of that is the green market system in New York. This is uh, the, like the Union Square green market I showed you. This is a map of where all the farmers are coming from, which is, a, you know, I think about a four hour radius of driving radius. Most farmers are closer in, but people come, farmers come as far away as four hours because the business is so good. Um, and these, it started out as a, as a, um, uh, a, um, single market in Union Square and is now 50 some markets around the city, all under sort of one operation. Um, Healthbridge was also working in Kathmandu. They were also concerned about the access to healthy foods in, in Kathmandu uh, and did the map. They were looking at the, both the mobile markets, the single stalls, the evening markets, the permanent markets, all these different market forms. So market cities nurture inclusive and multi-sectoral collaboration partners of the collective actions. A good example of that is uh, Toronto. They have uh, in probably 30 or 40 markets that are all, uh, some of them are operated by, you know, one operator, but basically it's a, a mixed group of people and they're essentially working together. This is where they are. Um, and the, the different types are on the bottom of the map. So they have these markets all over the world and they're, they're trying to do this like bottom up process that, that is really driven by the market to influence, you know, issues of common concerns at the city level um, and, um, you know, engaging the, the city, all the city divisions that are responsible for markets, which are multiple and, you know, how the markets can become, again, more of an important part of the city um, uh, decision making process. Uh, market cities support a wide variety of market types. I'm sure most of you are, would have been to Barcelona. They have a network of 43 public markets, really quite extraordinary. The green on them are the ones that have been renovated. The, the red ones are un, in process, I believe. Um, and they're you know, best known for their remarkable fresh food markets, um, really extraordinary. But they also spent 50 million euros building this flea market. Um, and the reason they built the flea market was so the center of this emerging district in Barcelona would have kind of a heart to it. And they understood that, you know, throughout the city, again, there's these markets, they're so distributed, they really are focal points for the entire city. And when they renovate the markets, they, you know, basically disassemble the historic structure, put it away, <coughs> dig a massive foundation, put uh, parking and servicing underground, and then rebuild the historic market back on top. And this allows them to combine supermarkets and, and market halls, which is interesting, because um, they, this, this, they don't need necessarily all the space for all the vendors. And lastly, uh, market cities invest in their markets. Um, this is in Hong Kong, uh, Link, 
REIT, the Real Estate Investment Trust, one of the largest real estate investment trusts in Hong Kong, inherited about 100 wet markets, they call them, um, when they took over the operation of shopping centers that were uh, operated by the um, uh, uh, Hong Kong Housing Authority. So these were markets that are you know, basically serving a low and middle income uh, population. Um, we're in very, you know, I visited some of the ones that haven't been renovated. They're in, you know, pretty much decrepit condition, similar, better than the ones at Han Hanoi, but not much. Um, and so um, they've taken an approach, they've done, renovated 33 of these. They started coming to our international conferences and I didn't have an actual opportunity to visit them until last December. And I was really quite amazed at at how they went to the conference, they didn't really often say very much, but they were taking copious notes and going back and, and pretty much doing all the best practices from around the world. Um, but they were looking at food quality and diversity and healthy diet and um, helping to you know, achieve broader goals, um, like redu reducing organic waste. Um, and they really you know, are open to sharing. And so that was, that's kind of the nice, and that's what we're finding about all these cities. They want to, people are kind of operating in their bubbles. They want to be like part of a, of a, of a, you know, a global network of market cities that can kind of learn from, learn from each other. So we're moving on. One of the, the closing uh, actions at our 2015 Barcelona conference was to issue this declaration, which um, advocated for public markets as part of the global development agenda, which actually happened, um, has been completed, um, and um, was uh, the new urban agenda was adopted in Quito in 2016, which includes support for urban rural linkages and public markets. And what we're really working now is on advancing understanding about the benefits of markets and, you know, and, and stronger inclusion in city and country policies. So, I think we, we have redefined the term market potential. Um, there's so much um, you know, opportunity out there for markets to uh, you know, sort of re redefine you know, a future of cities and to, in the process of in creating places where diverse groups of people come together and where locally owned operated business can thrive and where public spaces and places has become really focal point of the future development of cities into these you know, remarkable synergistic districts. We think the, you know, the potential is waiting. So if I'm sure there's some opportunity for some people from the Netherlands to get involved with this and you know, we look forward to continuing this conversation with you. So thank you very much, appreciate your attention and I could have time for a few questions, I guess.